You can open your Bibles to Acts 23. I'll give you a little heads up this morning. I'm going to use a word that is a little jargony, if, if that's a word. Um, and, and when we use these words, I know it's easy for them to be misunderstood. So I want to take a moment and just make sure we're all on the same page with what this word means uh, before we get into it. It's a word I think you're going to recognize, particularly if you've been in church for any amount of, uh, amount of time. You've probably heard it often enough. Um, but I would also venture to guess that many might struggle to give a clear definition of what this word means. It's often used as a synonym for another theological word, but they're not exactly the same thing. So I want to I want to draw the distinction between the two words, um, and, and maybe that'll help us understand. Uh, the word that it is often associated with is sovereignty. Sovereignty. What is sovereignty? Sovereignty is simply God's rule, right? His God has the right and the power to do whatever He desires on the earth. That's sovereignty. It's authority. It's power. This word is related, but it's slightly different. Any idea what the word might be? I'll put you on the spot this morning. That's unfair. It starts with a P. Providence. Providence. I saw several of you mouthing it, but we're just too shy to actually put it out there. The word is providence. A providence is closely related to sovereignty, but it's a little bit different, and here's how it's different. Providence is God's sovereignty put into action in order to accomplish His purposes. Right? Providence is sovereignty with a purpose. Moving towards a goal. In English, the word comes from the verb to provide, which means simply to supply what is needed. Right? So theologically, then, providence is a term that means, uh, and I'm going to steal a definition here from a book entitled Providence, of all things. Um, it, it, uh, the definition is this. It, providence is the act of purposely providing for or sustaining and governing the world. Right? So there's rulership, there's authority with purpose. It's it's providing, sustaining, it's governing. The catechisms that were born out of the Reformation all use the term the same way. They refer to providence as God's upholding and governing all things by the unmatched power that he possesses. Probably the most thorough definition comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith, which says this, The great God, creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things from the greatest even to the least by his most wise and holy providence according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. You see, there's sovereignty, there's power, but there's power with a purpose. And the confession sets the purpose for us, ultimately, as the glory of God himself. That's the aim of all creation. That is the aim of the sovereign authority and power of God at work in the world today. The aim is to the praise and the glory of God. This is the ultimate purpose. But there are many purposes which feed into, like streams feeding into a river, this overarching purpose of God's glory. And one of those feeder streams, one of those purposes, is God's providential care for His own people. 
the fact that God employs His sovereign power to accomplish His purpose for His people. In the text that we're going to look at this morning, this care is put to the test in several ways. And what we learn of the providence of God is that it can be quite surprising to us. Even those of us who have maybe walked with God for quite some time. The fact is God always accomplishes His purposes. But the way He goes about it can leave us amazed. And if we're not careful, perhaps even offended by the way in which He moves. With that in mind, let's take a look at Acts chapter 23. We're going to start in verse number 12. Uh, Again, you remember the background here. Paul has been uh, wrongfully accused and beaten by the Jews. He was stretched out and nearly scourged by the Romans. There was confusion about who he was. Uh, There was false accusations about him. Uh, Paul is given the opportunity to defend himself, but that didn't go so well, right? Uh, the, The Jews still said, this man needs to be done away with from the earth. So the Romans bring him in. They keep him under guard through the night. And this is where we pick up uh, in verse number 12, verse number 11, Jesus appears to Paul. He stands beside him and says, don't be afraid. You're going to be my witness. You're going to testify of me in Rome. And so now verse number 12, when it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks of Paul, or and told Paul, and Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me and asked me to bring this young man to you, because he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, Charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Then he called two of the centurions and said, Get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency the Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. Notice he conveniently leaves out the part about stretching him and nearly scourging him. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against this man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. When they had come to Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor. They presented Paul also before him. And on reading the letter, he asked what province he was from, And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. What do we make of this story? 
Paul falsely accused, still in prison. What will God do? What does God's providential care for Paul look like in a time of so much distress? Well, as I said previously, we're going to find there are some surprising notes to this providential plan. Forty men take an oath to kill Paul. This is the kind of oath, by the way, that was meant to be carried out quickly. As you can imagine, if you're going to take an oath not to eat or drink until you've done something, you don't want to delay that too long. I haven't had breakfast yet. I've already, that's too long. Their expectation, this is going to be done quickly, but this oath kind of has an expiration to it. Like if, if the thing becomes impossible to do, then you're kind of let off the hook. Not quite like our New Year's resolutions, right? Like I'm going to eat healthy this year. I'm going to eat healthy. Wait a minute, is that peanut butter pie? <laughs> probably a little more serious than that, okay? It's maybe a little bit more in the vein of what we would find in an Old Testament oath. Something like, may the Lord do so to me and more also if I eat any bread before Paul is dead. That's probably the serious note of this oath, which is ironic in itself because they're taking a vow, presumably before the Lord, that puts them in direct opposition to the Lord's plan. God had already told Paul, Paul, you're going to be my witness in Rome. Now these men are standing and taking an oath before God saying, Paul is not going to get to Rome. We're going to ensure the plan of God ends here. Not that they were aware of that, but this is in effect the position they've put themselves in. They decided to take matters into their own hands, and in so doing, they're violating the very law they claim to be upholding. They have completely abandoned Gamaliel's wisdom that we found in Acts chapter 5. When the apostles are standing before the Sanhedrin and Gamaliel says, So in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. And in that instance, they took his advice. Now all bets are off. They're willing to risk putting themselves in the position of opposing God in order to destroy this man. So they approach the Sadducees. Right? We know this because the Sadducees, the high priests, were typically almost always Sadducees. They come to the high priest. Not the Pharisees. Why not? Why would they not have gone to the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees, in the last council ended up siding with Paul, right? Remember, Paul's like, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I'm here today because I believe the Old Testament in everything that it says, including resurrection hope for Israel. So these men, shrewdly on their part, go to the, Sanhedrin, they go to the, the members of the Sanhedrin that they know will be in favor of their plan, and that includes the high priests. Which draws the high priest himself out, doesn't it? The high priest is willing to lie in order to facilitate, facilitate a plot of murder. Some more irony, isn't there, in that? The religious leaders are willing to side with a plan that has involved lying and murder, which are clear violations of God's standards, all while accusing Paul of not keeping the law on charges that could not be proven. Reminds us of the words of Jesus as he pronounced woes to the Pharisees. Matthew 23, he says, listen, you, you tithe your spices, yet have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You blind guide straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Willing to participate in murder. Willing to commit injustice. 
willing to forsake mercy, willing to abandon faithfulness to the clearly revealed plan and will and commands of God, to strain out the gnat that was Paul. The involvement of the high priest proves Paul's point about him being a whitewashed wall, doesn't it? When you look good on the outside, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and deadness. There's a bit of a warning here for us, I think. You know the term judgmental gets thrown around a lot these days. Anytime you call wrong, wrong, there's a threat that someone's going to call you judgmental. You can't judge me. Why are you so judgy? And yes, I am making up words today. All right? Jesus said, you can't judge me. Well, is that really what he said? If we put that in the context of the rest of Scripture, it's quite clear that Jesus is not saying we cannot call wrong, wrong. As a matter of fact, coming to someone that we love, that we care for, and, and warning them of the wrong that they may be involved in, speaking the truth to them in love, is itself the activity of love. Where we have to be careful is not to hold people to a standard that we're unwilling to hold ourselves to. Willing to overlook glaring sinful practices in ourselves and nitpicking in other people. No, oh, I just can't stand that person. Why? Just look. Do you hear what they said? Do you see what they do? We're just nitpicking. Reasons to judge them. Reasons to be offended by them. And all the while not willing to hold ourselves to the same standard. That's the oath that they took. There's a great risk here, though. These 40 men, I don't know if this dawns on you when you're reading through this passage, but these 40 men have taken an oath to attack Paul while he's under the protection of Rome. This is potential suicide on their part. I don't know what they expected. Like, at best, you sneak in, you kill the man, and maybe you get out with your lives, maybe you sink back into the crowd, maybe you disappear and no one finds you. But there's a risk of a run-in with the guards. There's a risk of a run-in with the tribune who happened to be over the, the security of Jerusalem. You don't think he's going to come looking for you? Paul's a Roman citizen under his protection. There is great risk to these men. And yet they are willing to take the oath. They are willing to follow through with it. Folks, there's a reality that, that says that Evil can be relentless in its pursuit of destructive behavior, destroying believers. There's a moment in the two towers, excuse me while I nerd out for just a second, okay? There's a moment in, you remember the Lord of the Rings, the two towers, there's a moment in that book, in those movies, as the orcs are overrunning Helm's Deep. This is where the men have taken their stand. They've broken through the walls. They're being overrun. And Theoden the king says, what can men do against such reckless hate? It's kind of this moment of, man, this is not going to end well. They hate us so much, they're willing to die in order to defeat us. They're never going to stop. It's never going to end. Think of Paul. Throughout his missionary journeys, he has been dogged by Jewish religious leaders who are fueled by their jealous hatred of him. Stop after stop after stop, causing problems, creating riots, seeking to kill Paul. It would have been understandable for Paul to say, what can I possibly do against such reckless, relentless hatred? They're willing to risk their own lives to get to me. How tiring would that kind of existence be? Would it not make you begin to doubt the providential care of God over your life if you feel like you're constantly looking over your shoulder, constantly wondering where the attack is going to come from? It's no wonder Jesus had to stand by Paul in verse 11 and say, don't be afraid. Paul needed the Lord's presence and he needed the Lord's message. 
You know what it's like to live under constant pressure, constant threat. Some of you even to your own physical safety. I know some of you, I know some, there are women here who have lived in an abusive situation, in an abusive home with an abusive husband. You never know when he's going to snap. You're always on eggshells. You're like walking through a minefield with every step and every decision, no matter how seemingly insignificant, could put you at risk. Some of you grew up with an abusive father. You experienced very much the same kind of pressure. It's oppressive. It's exhausting. For those of you who come out of those relationships, by the way, and perhaps you're still stuck in one, you need to know that Jesus stands by his people, giving them a reason to be courageous in the face of unrelenting evil. And can I encourage you to talk to somebody who will be on your side and seek your protection and your well-being? The evil can be relentless, but the threat is often hidden. Look, maybe that's not your story, right? Maybe you don't feel physically threatened this morning. But we know that evil is all around, that there is a lion who is seeking to destroy Christians all the time. The pressure of evil is unrelenting even when we are unaware. Look, Paul had no idea this plot was being made. No idea what they were planning. It was taking place in secret. And folks, it's one thing to know that the threat is there. It's one thing to see the threat. It's another thing to be caught off guard by it. What can you do against an unrelenting evil that is often moving in the shadows? The threat alone can wear you down. Put you on high alert for an extended period of time. Have you ever been on high alert for an extended period of time? I remember the first time I, I experienced this, shortly after Lacey and I were married. We were on our way to be in a friend's wedding in Columbus, Ohio. So we left Greenville, and we took I-75 north, which brought us real close to Cumberland Gap area, uh, in like Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, that little tri-state region. And we're going through the mountains, and all of a sudden, like, there's, there's trucks, there's tractors and trailers. It's a busy interstate, and all of a sudden, there's a torrential downpour. Like, visibility drops to almost zero, and there's trucks everywhere, and, and I'm driving with every fiber of my being on high alert. Let me tell you something, that's exhausting. Under the constant threat, Paul, how could he continue to minister? Where would he find encouragement? Folks, he found encouragement and he found boldness in the providential care of his Lord. This works for two reasons. It works to encourage and embolden for two reasons. Number one, Jesus stood by Paul, which means and was a reminder that Jesus cared deeply for Paul. But it also works because the providential plans of Jesus are not threatened by evil. They cannot be derailed by evil. Jesus never has to move to a plan B because the plans against you are too complicated or caught him off guard or were not accounted for. The evidence of this comes in the rest of this story. I want you to see here th this surprising range in God's providential care for his people. You know what I mean by that? Like, like surprising range. Like there's just a ton of variety here. God has a ton of options at his disposal. It's as if he has a playbook. You know what a playbook is, right? Football fans out there, you know what a playbook is? See the coach on the sideline, he's got that sheet of paper. It's got all the plays written all over it, all this code with all these complex movements and things that people are supposed to do. Some coaches, their playbook is so complicated that it takes the quarterbacks a couple of years in the same system, working with the same coach to really be comfortable in that system. Well, you got so many options at your disposal, so many nuances, so many ways to attack the opponent. It's as if God has a playbook 
that is 10,000 times larger than any you could ever imagine, that is vastly more complex than we can even comprehend. It is representative of his immeasurable, perfect wisdom. Which, by the way, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he says, listen, the foolishness of God is wiser than you. At your best, you are no match for the wisdom of God. Look at what I mean. God uses an individual here, the nephew of Paul, who we know nothing about. We don't even really know how old he is. The term young man here is oftentimes used for someone like from teenage to like maybe early 20s to mid 20s. It's kind of the range that that word is usually used in. I do have a hard time imagining the Tribune taking a 20 year old guy by the hand, though, as it says in verse number 19. So I, in my mind, I tend to picture a child here, although I really have no idea how old this guy is. But what do we know about him? He's Paul's nephew. And that's it. We don't know how he came across this knowledge. We don't know how old he was. We get no background. We get no information. He's not exactly the kind of guy that we would have picked out of a lineup in the book of Acts to go, he's qualified to bring about the deliverance for Paul. He's not the superhero. He's completely, in Luke's accounting, he is completely unimpressive. Someone who would have been easily overlooked. But it's an amazing reminder that the providential care of God for his people is not always limited to angelic deliverers like in Peter's case or miraculous interventions like Paul in the jail in Corinth when chains just fall off and doors just fling open. Sometimes God uses the ordinary, the overlooked, those who are unimpressive in order to bring about his plans for his people. Go back to 1 Corinthians again in verse chapter 1 and verse 27. Paul says, but God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God takes this unimpressive young man and uses him to completely unravel the best plan that the high priest, religious leader of Israel, and 40 of his best men could possibly muster. God unties it with a youth. Look at the second person. The second person that God uses here to accomplish his providential care for his people is much more impressive, but no less surprising. Because it's the Roman tribune who now takes drastic measures to ensure this plot against Paul was going to fail. Look at verse number 22. The tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you've informed me of these things. By the way, it's a bit of a miracle in and of itself that this man was even willing to have this conversation with a young Jewish boy on the basis of someone who was his current prisoner. God, in his providential care, gave this young man an audience with the Roman tribune who listened and acted and God's playbook encompasses the unimpressive. But this tribune is a lot more impressive. The tribune dismissed the young man, said, tell no one you've informed me of these things. In verse 23, he called two of his centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. Did you get that? 470 soldiers appointed to protect Paul. That's really, really impressive but also, I think, really, really unexpected. 
Who would have imagined that the very people who were ready to scourge Paul without a trial would now be willing to dedicate such force? It's not incidental that Luke is recording this for us. Remember Luke's point to Theophilus, this exalted uh, Theophilus, is this. Christians are no threat to Rome, Theophilus. In fact, this powerful tribune ordered the might of the Roman military to protect a Christian because he was innocent. This is a story of the remarkable range that God has at His disposal to bring about His plans for His people. He can use the unimpressive to unravel the plans of the powerful. He can turn enemies to act as allies. And He can literally move the military of the most powerful nation on the planet, one that was no friend to Christ or to Christians, just to get His people where He wanted them to be. That is impressive range. God's playbook is full of surprises, folks. There is nothing that evil can do to stop him from accomplishing all that he has planned for his people. Do you begin to see how this changes us? Life is no longer something to be feared. The future no longer cause for anxiety. Why? Because Jesus stands by his people. And he uses his sovereign authority and power to accomplish his purpose. His providential care for his people. We read in Psalm 118 where it calls us who fear the Lord to say, his steadfast love endures forever. Remember we read that at the beginning of the service. God's steadfast love endures forever. Much of the rest of that psalm, Psalm 118, is an explanation of of one aspect of that steadfast love, and that is God's providential care over His people. Let me read just a few verses uh, in Psalm 118. It says, Out of my distress I called on the Lord. There's the pressure, right? There's the threat. And the Lord answered me, answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Folks, in other words, with someone like this on our side, with someone like this standing with Paul, what does he have to fear? From relenting evil, from threat that is unseen, what have we to fear? Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon formed against you can prosper. If God is for us, who can be against us? Folks, the providential plans of God for us are not threatened by evil. The range of wisdom that God has at His disposal is impossible for evil to account for. It is not about God reacting to the plans of the evil one. It is about the evil ones being overwhelmed by the plans that God has put in place. Powerless to even alter those plans, much less stop them. Paul himself, by the way, is a perfect illustration of this. One day he was killing Christians, and the next day he was one. Who would have expected that? But folks, providence doesn't always turn out the way that we hope. No weapon formed against you shall stand, but that is not a promise that we're never going to be harmed. Because providence might not always look right to us. Might not always feel right to us. You can read down through the rest of the story, as we've already done, and and, and the Tribune writes a letter to Felix, and and the Tribune himself says... um, I found nothing wrong. I, I, he's, I don't see any reason for this man to be killed. He's done nothing deserving of death or imprisonment. Which, by the way, reminds us a little bit of another Roman official who uttered similar words in Luke chapter 23 when Pilate says to the crowd concerning Jesus, I find no fault in him. Here is Paul suffering in a similar manner to our Lord. 
And yet we know how things turned out for the Lord. He was crucified, though he was guiltless. Paul is not freed. There is no miraculous. He's still in prison. Yes, he's skirted death. Yes, he's delivered safely to Caesarea. Yes, he will get to say his peace again. But here is an innocent man, unjustly beaten, unjustly accused, remaining in prison, in spite of the fact that someone as powerful as a tribune says, there's no reason for me to keep you here. And yet he remains in prison. I'm not sure that's the kind of deliverance we were expecting for Paul. I'm not sure that's the kind of deliverance he was expecting. I'm not sure that he wasn't expecting that God was going to fling open the door to the prison again so he could walk out and get on a ship and sail to Rome. And guess what? This imprisonment is not going to end anytime soon. At the end of our chapter, chapter 23, he's going to talk to Felix. Felix is going to say, all right, well, I'm going to keep you in prison until your accusers can come and say their peace. And in chapter 24, those accusers arrive. They give their charges. Paul makes his defense. Felix talks with Paul. Felix sees no reason to keep Paul. And yet by the end of chapter 24, it tells us that Felix keeps Paul in prison because he wants, he's hoping to get a bribe from Paul. He's hoping to line his own pockets with Paul. And at the end of chapter 24, it says, when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. There's some hints of Joseph here, isn't there? Two years forgotten in prison, though completely innocent. Folks, that is not the kind of... Of, of, that is not the way we would expect the providential care of God to unfold for his people. This is a surprising element for us. God's providence might not always feel right. It might not always look right to us on the surface. It might not look right to us through the naked eye. But that's not because he has made a mistake. And it is not because he has forgotten. The reason it looks that way to us is because we can't always see his playbook. We we don't always understand what he's doing. We can't always see the outcome. We can't always comprehend the good that might come. That's one reason. The other reason is we don't always trust that he is near. We begin to doubt that he cares. So we grow weary and we become fearful and frustrated and we isolate ourselves when what we need more than anything is to be near the very people of God who can remind us of God's providential care for us. Well, sometimes we do see the outcome. I mean, the reality is Paul is under Roman care and he's going to be delivered to Rome under the protection of Rome, which is again another irony in this whole story. And because he is delivered to Rome under the protection of Rome, and under accusation that he has to stand before powerful people, it gives him immediate access to really influential people in the Roman society. So that he writes and says, hey, uh, those of Caesar's own household greet you in the Lord. What? Paul is given immediate access to Caesar's household. That's an outcome we would not have seen coming. Had Paul got on a ship as a free man and sailed to Rome, he would have sought out the Jews. We know that. He would have stood in the marketplaces and preached, but I highly doubt he would have had access to Caesar's household. Sometimes we see the plan of God as it unfolds. We can look back and go, ah, Now I get it. But sometimes, and in particularly when we are in the middle of such just incomprehensible providence, we're trying to figure things out. You don't always understand, and you don't always see, and you don't always get those answers. And I want to, what do we do in those cases? What do we need to remind ourselves of? 
You need to remind yourself that He cares and that He is capable. And His providential plans are not threatened by evil. And there is no greater place than to do this. There is no greater place to look in all the Scripture to remind ourselves or be reminded of this than the Gospel itself. And so to close, I want to go back to Psalm 118. Again, this psalm of thanksgiving to God, a psalm that reminds us of God's steadfast love that He shows to us by exercising His providential care over us in all our circumstances, even when we are overwhelmed and outnumbered, right? This is what this psalm is about. And yet listen to what it says in verse 14 of Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Salvation, folks, is what we want. It is what we need. And according to this psalm, it is the right hand of the Lord that does valiantly. It was God's own hand that brought about our salvation. His providence working in time in our world to accomplish our salvation. His providential care for His people being displayed in our rescue. Now, how does He do this? Again, check out the range of God's providence as He accomplishes our salvation. Verse number 19, it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. Now, park here for just a second because this exposes a problem for us. There is a gate that must be entered in order to get to God. It is a gate of righteousness, and we are not righteous. In fact, we are taught from the very beginning in the book of Genesis that the way back to God is guarded by a deadly angel with a flaming sword. Why? Because it is a pathway of righteousness, and you and I don't get to walk that pathway. If I try to enter into the presence of God, His righteousness will slay me where I stand. So how am I saved? What hope do I have? How do I enter into these gates? Verse number 21 says, I thank you that you have answered me and that you have become my salvation. You see the surprising element of God's providential care for us being displayed in the gospel. I could not save myself and yet God does it for me. You had to become my salvation. I could not be righteous. You had to be righteous in my place and on my account. Folks, what God would do such a thing? God simply make demands of people. That's what we expect from providence. We expect providence to tell us that you're on your own, that you must be righteous. You must do all of these things and hope it is enough that this God does something surprising, completely out of the ordinary that completely takes us off guard. It is scandalous. It is not what we would expect at all. This God becomes our salvation. How would he accomplish it? Verse number 22, check this out. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Where have you heard this before? If you've read the Gospels, you've heard it there. Luke chapter 20, Luke records a parable that Jesus spoke about a vineyard owner who put men in charge while he was away. And after a time, he sends messengers back to collect some of the fruit from the tenants who were there. But the tenants abused the messengers and sent them away empty-handed. And so he tries it again, and they do the same thing. And after a couple of tries, the owner decides to send his own son, thinking they will respect my son. They will respect the heir. And Jesus says that when the heir shows up, they see him coming and go, hey, this is the son. Let's kill him. Let's dispose of the body so that then inheritance of this vineyard will be ours. We'll become the owner when this man dies. It was subversive. And Jesus looks at them in verse number 17 and it says, but he looked directly at them and said, what then is it, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And Mark adds, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. What a surprise to his providence. If we didn't know any better, it would look like chaos, right? The son comes, and the son is murdered. That is not what we would expect. God becomes our salvation, and he does it through the death of his own son. 
the stone that was rejected, the stone that was put to death, the stone that died in apparent weakness, has become for us salvation. providence of God, folks, is not threatened by evil plans. When these men that Jesus spoke to in Luke chapter 20, when they became the parable by putting Jesus to death, it would appear that evil had won. But the worst they could do was exactly what God had intended to happen. We saw this twice in Acts already. Acts chapter 2. This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And you crucified him. Acts chapter 4, truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servants, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do what? To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Folks, the providential plan of God, displayed so clearly to us through our salvation, is not threatened by evil. And when we could do nothing to save ourselves, God used a rejected stone, one that appeared very ordinary. Remember Isaiah's accounting? There there was nothing majestic about him. There was nothing in him that would make us step back and go, wow, what a guy. Look at him. He appeared very ordinary. But it was this stone that God used to save us. And it was this stone who was the fullness of God in human flesh. What surprising range of the providence of God. To wrap divinity in human flesh. And when the Savior was arrested and murdered and all seemed lost, it was not the kind of salvation that we would expect. Providence didn't look right to his followers that day. It must have been a mistake. But the problem is ours. We didn't understand the playbook. We missed the clues that he left us. He'd been telling us all along, it's not about the sacrifice of animals or tabernacles in the wilderness or priests in fancy robes or holy days. It's about the perfection of my son who has become the ultimate and perfect sacrifice so that you may enter the gates of righteousness made into a kingdom of priests to dwell in my rest forever. This is the reminder that we need most when we have trouble discerning the providence of God in our lives, when we feel overwhelmed and outnumbered, when we feel like danger is lurking around every corner, when we are struggling to understand the hand of providence in our lives, when it does not appear to us to be very caring, when it does not appear to us that God is even near. We must preach again the gospel to our own troubled hearts and gather those with us who will help remind us But the gospel itself is evidence that God's providence is often surprising. Not the way we would have drawn it up. But his providential care for his people never fails. Let's bow to him this morning. Let's thank him for that providential care.